Do you know why humanity still doesn't have colonies on the Moon or Mars? Because the big companies that might have invested their money in building the said colonies are not sure when they'll get their investments back and start making a solid profit. Well, at least that's one of the reasons. But the cheaper space flights will get and further the technologies that can help cost efficiently settle on other planets will develop, the more countries, billionaires, tech giants, startups, and institutions will get into the space race whose finish line is right on the red planet. Why are they reluctant to do this? Are they afraid of future cataclysms? Do they know something we don't? Are they dreaming of claiming the title of pioneers? Or hoping to mine rare metals in the asteroid belt? Watch this video to find out all about the whens and hows of life on Mars, as well as about its outcomes, including a new round of human evolution and the possible demise of the planet itself. Wheels up! The first thing you need to know about Mars is that it will try to kill you. Although it's the most Earth-like planet in the solar system that used to have a dense atmosphere, abundant water sources, and a warm climate, today Mars is ruthless to men. Remember how the ancient Romans named the planet after their god of war because of its red color, the color of blood? Well, once we get there, we'll definitely sprinkle it with our own blood. As Elon Musk describes human exploration of the planet, a bunch of people will die in the beginning. Mars is a totally hostile environment for human life, combining extreme cold with an atmosphere unfit for breathing and intense radiation. But given the other options within our solar system, or lack thereof, Mars is prime real estate. A truly elite neighborhood compared to, say, Venus, whose atmosphere would crush you and burn you with sulfuric acid rains. Or Jupiter, for that matter. If you remember, this gas giant has no surface, so you'd just be falling through it until you're killed by radiation, ammonia, low temperatures, hurricanes, pressure. Then, as you'd be getting closer to the lower atmosphere, by pressure and temperatures higher than on the surface of the sun. The whole ride would take 12 hours, but no Terminator or Deadpool could survive even half of it. With Mars, Earthlings have a better chance. The Martian day lasts almost as long as the Earth day and is equal to 24 hours and 39 minutes. The axial tilt of Mars is close to the Earth's one, which means that the red planet has seasons that are very similar to the Earth's ones, although they last almost twice as long. There is also water ice and remnants of the atmosphere on Mars. This, plus enthusiasm, optimism and scientific achievements, gives us hope to survive in case Earth is threatened by a global catastrophe. By the way, there are six very real ways our home planet can be destroyed and some might start at any moment. Do we have alternatives to Mars? Yes, we do. For example, building a massive rotating wheel space station to call our home, like the one in the 2001, a space odyssey movie. But such an ambitious project would require so much building material and equipment to be launched into space that it's still less realistic than a Mars colony. Plus, to create artificial gravity, the station should be about 40-50 meters in diameter, the more the better. Some engineers offered to rotate asteroids instead of stations, literally, by digging out their insides and settling people there. However, there is a problem. Most asteroids of the right size are not solid. Those are loose clusters of rocks and dust that will fly apart long before they reach a useful rotation speed. So back to Mars again. What have we already found on the red planet? In the history of research, 11 robots inhabiting the planet have found ice, evidence of liquid water beneath the planet's surface, organic molecules, chemicals capable of supporting some microbes, active methane, geological material, many, many rocks and regolith rich with high iron oxide. By the way, why is there so much oxidized iron on a planet with almost no oxygen in the atmosphere? A real mystery. Maybe you know the answer. Write your guesses in the comments. Is everything we've found so far enough for humans to survive? Of course not, but still, there are some important resources. That's why NASA plans to send astronauts to Mars, probably sometime in the 2030s, and is currently working on six technologies for this mission, which we'll tell you about later. But the US isn't the only one with Martian-scale ambitions. 
the United Arab Emirates has developed a century-long plan to start colonies on the Red Planet. All stages are scheduled up to 20,117. At the same time, China declares sending people to Mars its long-term goal. Moreover, those who want to taste Martian life right now can visit the Gobi Desert Colony model by Chinese scientists. And of course, not to forget Elon Musk, who has set the goal of creating a transportation system to Mars and back. By the way, very soon, SpaceX Starship should have its first real flight and we'll tell you about it in detail. So, assuming we have the rockets to go to Mars, what kind of problems might we encounter on our way? The first one is a long flight. It took the Apollo astronauts an average of three days to reach the moon. But a trip to Mars would take six to nine months. Since the distance between Mars and Earth fluctuates from 5 to 6 to 400 million kilometers due to their elliptical orbits, there is only a small window when the position of the planets is ideal for space travel. This greatly complicates logistics. However, it's not the biggest problem. Prolonged flight exposes people to the greatest horror of space travels, solar flares. These are the most powerful types of explosion in the solar system. A single flare could be equivalent to 100 million thermonuclear bombs. Earth's magnetic field can protect astronauts in orbit, but a deep space traveler to contact such amounts of radiation won't be able to survive more than a few days. The Apollo program didn't have a solution to this problem, counting on the chance that the Moon mission wouldn't take long and avoid another flare. But a Mars mission is a different story. It's too long to hope for a miracle, and it's impossible, at least for now, to accurately calculate and predict flares, especially on the side of the Sun that faces away from Earth. To solve this problem, spacecraft are to be equipped with shield-protected panic rooms. Shields might come in very different forms, such as water tanks or new materials still in development. Dear friends, subscribe us and view us off to our robot YouTube channel. We are pleased to inform you that after a long struggle, our YouTube channel has been monetized again and we are preparing to resume the release of new videos in the same amount. We want to thank everyone who supported us in this difficult period. Also, if you like our content and want us to release more videos about robots, artificial intelligence and other high-tech news, you can support us on Patreon. You will find more information in the description below this video. We look forward to seeing you again and your feedback on the new format. See you soon. Another solution, or at least a factor that reduces the danger of travel, is the development of new super-powered engines that could speed up the delivery of humans to Mars. Right now, NASA is exploring several possible options, all of them utilize nuclear powers. For example, it's known for sure that nuclear electric and nuclear thermal units are in development right now. Both engines use nuclear fission, though differ significantly in efficiency and power. The agency's website states that NASA is working with partners to develop, test, and improve critical components of various propulsion technologies to minimize the risks for the first human mission to Mars. The second technology NASA is working on is an inflatable heat shield for astronauts to land on the planet. Such a shield was of great help for the Perseverance landing when NASA managed to land on Mars the heaviest rover in history. However, it was only the size of a car. The spacecraft for long-distance flights would be much, much bigger. And now experts are working on a large inflatable shield that will be sturdy but won't take up much space when transported. The technology isn't ready yet, but flight tests of a 6-meter diameter prototype will soon be underway in the Earth's atmosphere, which is much denser than the Martian atmosphere. If the shield can withstand such heat, it will also work on Mars. Suppose everything works out and the ship with the astronauts lands successfully. What's next? Unlike Earth, Mars has no planetary magnetic field. Because of this, the planet's once dense atmosphere was gradually disintegrated by the solar wind in just a couple of hundred million years. Today, atmospheric pressure on Mars is less than 1% of that on Earth, and the atmosphere itself is a toxic plume consisting mostly of carbon dioxide, argon, and nitrogen. Not only it's unfit for breathing life forms, the rarefied atmosphere also can absorb and retain the sun's heat, which leads to severe temperature drops. Even in summer, at the equator, it may be 20 degrees Celsius during the day and minus 70 degrees at night. At the same time, it might be minus 150 degrees at night at the pole. 
What does it mean? Imagine a cheerful Martian morning. You came out of a spaceship wearing underpants and a t-shirt. Let's forget for a moment the lack of oxygen and atmospheric pressure. What will you feel? Warm sand under your feet, your ankles and calves slowly turning to ice, and everything above your waist almost cryogenically freezing. But it'll be already too late for you to feel anything. And that's when NASA's projects come to the rescue once again. The agency is creating personal spaceships for astronauts, like high-tech spacesuits, with a modular design that allows them to be universally used anywhere in space. They even have a fitting name, Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or XEMU. The first real tests of these suits will take place on the Moon as part of the Artemis mission. For Mars, they'll be additionally upgraded with life support technologies in a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere and a modified top layer that'll keep the astronauts warm during the Martian winter and prevent them from overheating during the summer. But the astronauts won't spend all their time in spacesuits. In the long term, houses and even cities should be built for them in caves or under domes. We talked about this in detail in the other video, check the link in the hint. In it, we also mention the first home for the brave colonists, a Mars rover, which combines the functions of a proper house and a vehicle. Such a solution is quite obvious when there is an urgent need to minimize the number of items to take for a journey this long. The Hermetic mobile houses will also have durability and convenience tests on the moon. NASA has conducted extensive tests on Earth, taking the best, including the robotic rovers. Inside, there will be everything to ensure life for several weeks. Moreover, it'll be possible to wear comfortable clothes indoors and put on a spacesuit only to exit the rover. So, housing is not a problem. NASA is also experimenting with air. For example, the Perseverance rover has a special device called MOXIE that creates oxygen from CO2 in Martian conditions. If MOXIE works the way scientists hope, astronauts on Mars won't only have their own oxygen production but also use it as a component for rocket fuel to return to Earth. What about food? We all remember The Martian and how Matt Damon's character was growing potatoes by fertilizing the planet's soil with his own feces. But in reality, scientists' farming ambitions on Mars haven't gone that far yet. For the past few years, NASA has been funding research trying to grow snow algae, common for Earth's deserts and highlands, under conditions that mimic those on Mars. The research is still in its early stages, but the reports say that the algae are growing nicely. They can proliferate, serving as a source of both food and extra oxygen in flexible greenhouses, similar to a spacesuit for vegetation. No information on the taste of algae, though. To report back on algae growth, astronauts will use laser communication that will greatly speed up the information transfer between Earth and Mars. NASA has already tested the technology on the Moon and soon will launch a properly equipped vehicle into deep space for scientists to research what it takes to use the same technology millions of kilometers away from our planet. There, on the red dot in our sky, the first colonists will be virtually isolated from the rest of humanity, which scientists believe could lead to a new round of human evolution. In just a few generations, Martians may noticeably differ from Earthlings. Firstly, living conditions, including low gravity and high radiation, would trigger new mutations. Increased mutation rates will trigger the natural selection mechanism. New generations would be more and more adjusted to life on the red planet. Also, high levels of radiation on Mars may directly affect physical characteristics such as skin color or eyesight. In addition, once colonists understand what they need to survive, they may themselves begin experimenting with genetic engineering to ensure the survival of the next generation. The same could happen to plants grown on Mars for sustenance. The prospects seem bright, but some scientists are sounding the alarm. They claim that the invasion of a large number of terrestrial bacteria on Mars could cause the destruction of the local ecosphere and even destroy the planet. What do you think how human colonies on Mars would look like and what they'll result in? Write your predictions in the comments, join our social media communities, and stay up to date with all the news from the world of high-tech.